Hi everyone, I'm Kieran. We're starting one minute early, so maybe we're going to get uh, one minute extra. Um, what I wanted to talk about, I called it Doodle Driven Development. Really, it's my attempts to do more drawing, uh, and maybe my attempts to convince HMRC that my iPad and pencil are a tax deductible expense when I'm doing consulting. Um, thanks, mate. And I've always found it hard to draw things. Um, I think it, it's odd, my dad was an art teacher, but at school there was like the science kids and the creative kids, and I kind of self-selected myself into this, this science kid category. Um, but recently I've been trying to do more of it, and I like people who draw. Here's some. Uh, Gemma Cameron, who I don't know personally, um, did a bunch of uh, talks about bringing user stories to life uh, through illustration using um, you know, cartoons to make people really understand who is this for, what are the benefits they're getting, and I found that quite inspirational. Um, Jenny Martin, whenever you do a workshop with her, there's always some sort of creative thing you're forced to do that really unlocks a load of ideas. Uh, and when she and Pete talk about uh, the oopsie process, one of the key things there is really visualising what the outputs of this system are going to look like. What's it going to be like? I don't mean the UI, but like, how would it feel to hold this thing in your hand when you get the outcome you want? And Matt, I've been doing some workshops and training with Matt, and he's very good at putting people in a situation where they have to draw something, which is outside my comfort zone and has really helped me. Except he's not very good at refilling the pens. <coughs> um, that's the only problem. So in a BDD context, let's use this frame to think about BDD. So. There's the th three phases people talk about. There's discovery, figuring out what we're going to do, what we're going to build, um, what outcomes we want. There's formulation, where we sort of make some decisions, capture that, make it a bit more refined, flesh it out a bit, document it somewhere, put it in a, in a system where we can keep it for a short time until we build it. And then there's the kind of test automation bit at the end, where we use these useful outputs from that process to make sure the thing we've just built fulfilled the things we talked about in the first place. And that through line has been kind of preserved. And the typical way people do this is using words um, verbally. So having really good verbal conversations where we're talking about things. Um, maybe using something like example mapping or another workshop format to add a kind of layout aspect to that, but we're kind of thinking, of, we're talking. <laughs> and then capturing the outputs of that conversation in Gherkin, or something like Gherkin, which is like the conversation we had. It's enough like the conversation we had that it's going to be useful, but it's re readable. And then using something like Cucumber to, to automate the outputs. So what does that look like when you're drawing things instead? Let's start with discovery. Um, it's always good to start with discovery in any process. So I'm going to talk a bit about one project I've been working on recently, which is in a credit card company. And one of the most important things about discovery is coming to a shared understanding, right? It's not a one-way system. A lot of the time you're building an understanding with business people, with subject matter experts about how the system should behave. In our case, we've got a small team of developers some product owner type people, and a few sort of subject matter experts who've done loads of credit card products in the past and join us for these sessions. And the bit I want to use as an example is this part of the system where people use credit cards in the real world, and other parts of the system decide whether they're allowed to spend the money and that kind of stuff. And eventually we get a stream of events. And these events are things like the stuff on the left, authorization, reversal, presentment, increments. This isn't stuff that customers understand. It isn't stuff that customers are exposed to. And often in that event stream, you'll have several contradictory messages uh, that are kind of overriding each other. For instance, we might have authorized a transaction, but then the message took too long to get there, and then someone upstream of us, maybe even the terminal in the store, decided to decline it instead. So the job of this part of the system is to take these stream of events and build uh, a user understandable model, which is what you're going to see in the app. And the user understandable model isn't that you had 20 messages about a particular transaction that all contradicted each other, it's that you've got a, a transaction that's in a particular state. 
And this is all really hard to understand. The stuff on the left, none of the people in the team really, the development team had, had come across these concepts, um, but they did understand the stuff on the right. So we were having a lot of conversations around what should happen in this particular sequence of events, what should the state look like for, for, the, for the customer? And it was complicated. We, we ended up trying to talk about it verbally to start with. Um, and the scenarios we're coming out with, we agreed on them, we understood them, but we were kind of missing the bigger picture. How do these things connect to each other? We weren't really getting that, those revelations about what the rules are. But the, the subject matter experts were really good at saying, OK, in this specific situation, this is what we should do. But we weren't getting that shared understanding. Uh, and when I was, I was, I'm coding on this project as well, so when I'm talking to the developers about it, we're sort of drawing this kind of thing. Um, at some point, someone said, quite wisely, maybe it was me, <laughs> um, it sounds like this part of the system is like a state machine, right? You've got, we're in a particular state, and when we get the next message, be nice if we could do that just considering one message at a time, move to a new state. So we were in this weird situation where we were having this kind of communication between the business and the developers. It wasn't, you know, gherkinized at that point. But then to actually understand it, the developers are drawing pictures. Because the important thing is the flow around the system. How do we go between these states? So once we identified that, we said, let's start using that format to talk to the business. So instead of uh, doing example mapping, or as well as doing example mapping for some of the other features, for these things, let's start drawing pictures. Uh, this is one I drew sitting next to another developer with the product owner when we were trying to understand how uh, authorizations and presentments happen. An authorization is you tap your card or put it in the thing, and we say, yes, that person can spend that money. And presentment is later, the merchant tells us, yes, that guy actually spent the money. So authorization is the point at which you get handed the goods, probably. And presentment later is like, it can be up to 10 days later, the merchant tells us, by the way, your, your cardholder spent some money with us. So by drawing this, we kind of got to, oh, you can't see the colors that well. Um, we kind of got to an understanding that you start off without a transaction. When you get an authorization, we show a pending transaction. The happy path is then it presents for the same amount, and we show that as a completed transaction. It might present for more, in which case we're going to increase the amount, but say it's completed. It might present for less, in which case we'll kind of complete that much of it, but we'll say the rest of it's still pending. Um, and then there's some stuff about what happens next. So in one diagram, we're kind of fitting in <coughs> six examples of uh, in this state. When this happens, this, this is the next state. And this is a lot easier. Obviously, it's contextual. For our team, this was a lot easier to understand than the equivalent six gherkins, gherkin scenarios. The reason is you're zooming around the picture yourself and you're, you're looking at the things you're interested in and you're filtering out the things you're not interested in. Uh, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. You self-select which bits you're going to look at and you kind of go, what's that? What's going on over here? <laughs> um, so we... We started doing this, and we, we had this problem, how big do we draw the picture? Obviously, this is a little subset of the transactions. We played around with big, big diagrams. They were too big. Tiny diagrams, they were too simplistic. It wasn't worth doing a diagram. And we kind of found a natural size for this kind of thing was around one or two rules. And it's the, two, the two dimensionality of a drawing is quite good for illustrating a rule. It's like, in this situation, this can happen or this can happen. You know, you've got another axis to play with. Uh, text is one-dimensional. So making that effective, um, first thing is you have to have your three amigos type sessions somewhere where you can draw a picture, which involves a tiny amount of extra organization of remember to bring your pens with you, let's have it in the meeting room that has a nice whiteboard, that kind of thing. Um, you have to pick the right format. I, I'm showing a kind of boxes and arrows format, but that's because that was the sort of key thing we wanted to understand about our system. If the key thing um, we wanted to understand, uh, if, if the most important thing to understand our business rules was who is involved, 
we'd have started drawing pictures where the, the identities of the people involved are really evident, like Gemma Cameron's user stories. Or if the outcomes are something that is the most important thing to understand, we'd be drawing, you know, this is what the report looks like. And don't force it. So have the opportunity to draw things, but probably example mapping is going to work for most things. So once you've had a great conversation, we've drew, we drew the picture, everyone remembers the picture, everyone understands the domain problem, we, we, we sort of need to capture it uh, for living documentation, uh, for future generations, and with sort of half a mind that we're going to automate it. So uh, why is Gherkin good? Gherkin's really good because it looks like the conversation you had. It has the same phrases, it has the same uh, keywords. You can read, <coughs> you can read Gherkin that's been written after a Three Amigos session really quickly. You kind of skim through it and it's all familiar and yet that's what we said, yep, yep. Oh, that's not quite what we said. You spot the inconsistencies and it's, it's kind of understandable. If you get Gherkin emailed to you from the head office on a different continent, you have to spend ages reading it and trying to understand it. When it works well, it's a reminder of what you talked about. That's because it looks enough like the conversation that it's just fine. you're just checking it. We found when we're drawing diagrams and then writing Gherkin scenarios, you lose that. So we're drawing a diagram and then writing out a bunch of scenarios, and then it's like they're new scenarios from a stranger. You're having to read through them and make sure you understood them properly. The other benefits of Gherkin is it's trackable in version control. You get a good diff, and it's parsable by machines. So we started to look at, for once we've decided how we're going to draw this picture, we're trying to find a diagram format that's close enough that it's going to resemble the picture we drew. Um, one option we thought about was HTML and SVG and CSS. Only one person in the team was good enough at front-end technologies to be able to do this, so we sort of out. Um, Mermaid.js is attractive because it's rendered client-side. There's a couple of other tools. We ended up using GraphViz. In this specific context, I'm not saying use GraphViz for everything. Um, GraphViz looks like this. It's an AT&T uh, tool um, from, I think, the late 80s. It's been maintained ever since. So it's got lots of tooling around. Uh, and basically, we represent all the transactions all the transitions in the diagram in this text format and then run a command line thing and this pops out. Uh, so that's pretty much good enough to show that to a, a business stakeholder and say, this is what we drew yesterday, right? Um, and if you spend another hour reading the man page, you can sort of make it look quite a lot like. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to make it look exactly like the thing, but you want it to be enough that when, when I get this in my email inbox, I say, oh yeah, that's that thing we wrote. It's I think it's quite important to have things spatially arranged the same way. Uh, so in this format, you can sort of tweak the coordinates of things. The thing that's on the left when we drew it should be, yeah, that's your left, that's fine. The thing that's on the left when we drew it should still be on the left in the diagram, if you want that recognition factor. And a side benefit we hadn't really realized was you can embed an image in a document much easier than you can embed a document in a document for some reason. So it's quite hard to embed Gherkin into your Markdown documentation, um, but image tags exist and work really well. So we've now got a README where a lot of the way the system operates is explained by these diagrams that were based on a picture we drew on a whiteboard or on an iPad. So find a format that's... Don't spend too much time finding a particular format, but find one that's close enough to what you drew that's going to kind of spark recognition. Try and forget what format you're going to use when you're doing the initial conversation. You don't want to sort of stop someone drawing a specific thing because our tool doesn't support it. It's the same trap you get with Gherkin, right? Uh, try and forget that. Uh, and if you're not rendering the images client-side, you're going to have a synchronization problem. You have to maybe check in, in your CI server, has someone edited the source code without regenerating the image? And that's a bit of a pain. So the last bit, I've got 30 seconds. Um, Automation. Um, because it's a text-oriented format, you can automate tests based on this source code very easily. That's the source code. Um, it's a PHP project, like all good fintech. Uh, so this is the test, right? Um, open the file, read every line. If the line doesn't have an arrow on it, ignore it. 
If the line doesn't match this pattern that we know how to read, throw a massive error. And if you did manage to extract those three things, these are wrong. Uh, set the system up in that state, apply the event, check the new state. Didn't take long to do because I didn't try and write a generic testing tool that's driven by GraphViz. I just thought, here's a specific set of source codes. I need to be able to write tests based on them. That's why it's exploding early. If I don't know how to parse it, let's reject the format. Because all of these are going to be written by the developers in my team based on a conversation. Much like Gherkin explodes if you use the wrong keyword, it's not the stakeholders writing it. So you can cheat the format. Um, once you've picked a text format, it's great if that format supports comments, because then you can put in comments saying, hey, testing tool, this bit's a test. This is the bit you should pay attention to. Ignore this block. You don't know how to parse it. So come at it from the angle that it's going to be the developers writing the diagrams. Um, and do the easiest thing that works and have tests that break quickly. Um, because you're going to be using a different format on the next project or even on the next feature. So you want small tests that just uh, automate your diagram effectively. So do more drawing and discovery. Find good machine formats. I've started bookmarking <laughs> interesting tools that generate images from source code, and I should probably publish that, and write crap tests. Scrappy tests. Um, one accident that came out of this is once we had loads of these diagrams, and once we'd established a vocabulary, we started using it for exploratory testing. So we kind of ran the system backwards. I mentioned we can get these events in any order. We started generating sequences, all the possible sequences of events, projecting that through our system, and then from the outputs, drawing a diagram. So this is a section of it. Um, it's embedded in the, our source code, but we've got to say, in every possible situation, this is, this is the state the system will end up in and give that to our subject matter experts. Because it's visual, they very quickly, you know, they look at it and go, yeah, this looks all right, this looks weird. Let's write some, this is the wrong behavior. Let's have a different conversation and actually write some uh, examples based on that. So I've overrun. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> if you want to do a talk at BDD London, at us on Twitter. If you know someone who should do a talk at BDD London, at them, at us, and we'll make it happen. Thanks. So, although he may have overrun, we still have some time. The timer went. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so that, you had your 15 minutes of fame, but we mm. do have a little bit of time before the lunch people are ready. Okay. So does anybody have any questions? Ooh, two. Great. Let's start over here. Thank you. I have one question. This is Yuan from Canon. Um, well, yes, a picture uh, was a southern word, but then a picture sometimes 100 people may have uh, 200 interpretations. Do you experience when you use uh, drawings, a, apart from people drawing them, other people introduce ambiguities, and then does that, is a problem for your project? Yeah, it's important that everyone... I think it's very important that it's coming out of discovery. So when we're drawing this on the whiteboard in a small group, we know what the arrow means. I clicked too many times. You get what I mean, right? When you're standing next to someone and you're drawing a line, <laughs> everyone kind of knows what you mean. Everyone kind of knows what you mean because you're having a conversation and you're, oh, this connects to this, or this, this you know, causes this to happen. Same thing happens with Gherkin, right? You write a sentence, and then if someone wasn't in the conversation, they might completely misinterpret it. Um, there probably is more room for misunderstanding in a diagram. Um, and actually, something I didn't mention, the, one of the places where it's not appropriate is when there's a lot of detail that needs to be embedded, and that detail, the text of that detail is important. So something that's data-heavy. In our domain... We were able to sort of simplify, you know, this is, there's, a, there's a complicated concept behind this, but we were able to sort of represent it with a word, and everyone kind of knows what that means in our data schema. If you had to put loads of stuff into that box, it, the diagram wouldn't make sense. It's because it's the arrows make sense. So, yeah. yeah. So, Karen, uh, well, three slides from the end, you had uh, one point that said uh, write brittle tests, and you didn't speak to that, and I just wanted you to speak to that yeah. point. So the brittleness is, is kind of the point of this thing, right? 
if, if there's a line that doesn't match this pattern, I'm not going to be able to automate a test based on it. So I'm not supporting graph viz. I'm supporting a really tight subset that is the stuff we wrote. This is how we're going to write it in our source code. Anything else is going to break the tests. So if another developer comes and, you know, something <coughs> simple that's supported by the language, like a line break here, is going to break. So I want that to happen early rather than it being, you know, silently ignored. And maybe this case isn't tested in the suite. I want to be quite brutal of like being, not being lenient in what it accepts. Because the people writing the thing have to write a subset of the source code. Thank you.